The photos you're looking at are of two classrooms. One was early 20th century. The other could be considered a modern classroom. This photograph should terrify you. Let's look at it. I don't see any difference between the photographs. Students are all the same age. They're sitting in their desk. They're facing the teacher. The teacher is solely in command of what's happening in that classroom. Now, some of you may be observant and say, look at the modern classroom, there's technology. But let's look at that technology. It's solely in control of the teacher. The students aren't interacting with it at all. I contend it's really just a high-priced chalkboard. I want to talk about students, students that I've worked with. I've been involved in public education for 30 years. Actually, if you take my time as a student, an assistant principal, a principal, central office, and as the CEO of a cyber charter school, it's been 50 years in public education. In that time, I've seen public education innovate, and I've seen it thrive. And lately, I've seen it become very stale and stagnate. If I could use the analogy of a sailing vessel, our public education system right now is beginning to take on water, and it's starting to sink. The tragedy is it's not just the ship that's sinking. It's taking tens and thousands of our school-age children along with it. These are two students I'd like to talk to you about, Lorenzo and Amanda. Lorenzo, when we first met him, met all your stereotypes of your typical urban student. His caregiver drug him into our building. He sat there with his arms folded, his hood up over his head. He was shut down. She explained that he was one week from dropping out of high school. He was in 10th grade and had earned one, earned one credit towards graduation. It took three days until any of our staff were even able to talk with him, though he would have a conversation. But once we did, there was something endearing about him. And we also discovered some unique gifts. Amanda, on the other hand, most people would describe her as absolutely the exact opposite. High achieving student, extremely motivated, also extremely independent, and she beat to her own drum. She was that student that would walk into class and go, why are we learning this today? Is there another way we could learn this? Could I do this on my own and what are we gonna do tomorrow? Oh, we know how popular that is in a traditional classroom. She also had some very unique skills and gifts. I'm gonna talk more about these gifts later, but we need a little bit of background first before we can far, go farther into our discussion of public education. By 2020, the United States is gonna face a shortage of five million workers. The jobs are there, we don't have the workers with the skill set to fill them. In Pittsburgh, just the city of Pittsburgh, by 2025, there'll be a shortage of 80,000 workers just in the city of Pittsburgh alone. The unemployment rate right now in the United States is five, or in Pennsylvania, I'm sorry, is 5.6%. However, in Erie, it's 6.9%. Actually, the updated figure that was just published 24 hours ago is 7.1% and climbing. How do we have this disconnect? Thousands, if not millions of jobs out there waiting, but yet our unemployment rate has gone stale and stagnated. Let's add some more information. We read the headlines in public education. Our high school dropout rate has improved. The last year we have data available was 2012. And in 2012, 750,000 students dropped out of schools in the United States. Now, the good news is that's an improvement because in the years leading up to 2012, the average was one million per year. Now, lots of folks have heard about STEM. What is STEM education? It's really simple. Science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Those are where the careers are going to be. However, we can't lose sight that no matter their profession, even it being a STEM profession, we need the literature skills of reading and writing, and we can't lose sight of that. Common Core. You can't read anything about education without some mention of Common Core. Simply, what is it? The intent of Common Core was to establish benchmarks at every grade level that we feel our students in our country should know so they can compete globally with students from other countries. Noble. 
makes a lot of sense. The problem was the implementation. How we implemented it into a system. And that system now, if you look across our country, the students are learning the same thing, the same way, at the same time. And oh, by the way, they're all tested with the exact same test to see if they got it. And finally, our student debt. The student debt in the United States right now is $1.2 trillion. The average student comes out of college with $44,000 in debt. The average Pennsylvania student comes out with $33,000 in debt. All right, let's put it together. We have the jobs out there waiting to be filled. We have students graduating from college with debt, but there's a disconnect. We're graduating students in the professions oftentimes that no longer exist or the need's not there. And at the same time, we have thousands and thousands of jobs going unfilled. We can fix this. I absolutely have confidence we can fix this. But it's going to take K-12 education, higher education, business and industry, and oh yes, our policymakers, to get together to come up with a solution. We have to start talking to our students about what they want to do when they're 25 and 30 years old. What excites them? What gets them out of bed in the morning? Talk to them about careers in those types of fields. We can no longer look at a high school education as preparation for college, and then college is the only thing that prepares you for the workforce. We have to get students involved earlier. And if we involve business and industry, we can get students still in K-12 education doing internships and job shadowing and studying their professions, even working in their professions, before they even start their formal education in those fields. For us to change public education, we have to ask hard, serious questions. The three photos you see on the screen represent those three questions, and let's go through them. The first one is, why do we insist that students of the same age are placed in the same grade, learn the same content the same way at the same time? In that individual classroom, if you walked into any third grade classroom in our commonwealth or across the country, you would find third grade students are no more than a few days to a few weeks in variance of what they're being taught and how they're being taught. And there are students in that classroom that have identified learning disabilities. There are students that are identified as being gifted and a whole lot of what we might call average or typical students. However, the pacing is the same for all those students. They may get remediation and they may get richment, but they're taught the same thing at the same time. Every teacher should walk into every lesson and they should ask the one question to start. How many of the students in front of me right now already know the material I'm about to teach? The second question immediately needs to be, then why am I teaching it if they already know it? When are we going to get to the point that we have an educational system that meets kids where they are? That we know where kids are and we move them forward from that point. Instead of it being dictated by a printed textbook or a written curriculum and hope they get it and hope they can keep up. We can do better. The other group is at the other end of the spectrum, our high school students. Why do we insist on warehousing our oldest students, those between the ages of 14 and 18 years old, in multi-million dollar facilities called high schools? With the modern technology we have available to us now, as well as content providers like Khan Academy, Discovery Channel, National Geographic, and dozens of others, why can't they learn some of that content on their own, where they want, when they want, and how they want? Then all we need to do is come up with the assessments to make sure they have that knowledge. Wouldn't it be wonderful if high schools eventually become a resource for high school education instead of the sole venue for it to occur? If you look at a typical high schooler's day and you take out time spent in lunch, changing classes, study halls, the time it starts to start class and end class, most high schoolers in a six to seven hour day get 90 minutes to three hours of instruction. I don't consider that efficient. Certainly not fair to these kids that we warehouse for hours and hours on end. Now the final question. This is one of the greatest long-standing pillars in sacred cows in education, grading. Grading discounts the single most important learning experience we have as human beings, failure. We all learn more from our failures than our successes. But failure is worn as a badge or a black mark forever in grading. Let me give you an example. A world-class downhill skier does not put the skis on their feet and go down the mountain 70 miles an hour the first time. 
The first time they put the skis on, they go down the slope and they fall. Or if we assigned a grade, that would be an F or a failure. Over a little bit of time and a little bit of practice, they can eventually go from the top of the mountain to the bottom of the mountain, albeit somewhat slow. So now we could assign the grade of a C or maybe proficient. But a few select individuals given God-given talent and a lot of time and practice become world-class skiers. Now, if we would rate that person, we'd say, oh, they're an A+. Not if we grade them. If we grade them, we have to calculate in all those times they failed and all those times they were just average. So at the very best, that world-class skier might be a solid B or B+. Let's look at this from another way. Do you want your heart surgeon or the roofer shingling your roof to do so at a C or even a B level? I don't know about you, but if I'm facing quadruple bypass, I would really like all four of them to be successful. The, shing- the roofs, you know, the, your roof, the shingles on your roof. Don't you want 100% of them not to leak? Not just a real solid 95%? We've got to look at some of the skills we teach in our schools as absolutes. They simply have to be done a particular way to be good enough. That's what we do in the workplace. You turn a report into a boss, a case brief into the court, you do a proposal for a customer, a machinist, machines apart. It's got to be done a particular way. It's the standard for that profession or that trade. We have to look at some of our academic skills that way. A grade is not good enough. It simply has to be done correctly. There's some entities right now getting into education. It's an exciting time. I just want to name two that I think show tremendous promise for us as educators. One is Amazon. You're all familiar with Amazon. For most of us, that was our first experience with online shopping, and then the addiction was built from there. Amazon is now in education in what's called the Open Educational Resources. Open Educational Resources are where any teacher, any school building, any school system can start to write its own content, develop content by themselves or with collaboration of other entities, and upload it to the Amazon cloud. And then that can be shared by anybody else that's part of it and used in their classroom. The neat part is Amazon takes those same mechanisms they use in the retail space. So when you buy your shoes or boots, they make recommendations for you in the future when you log on. Now they can do the same thing with educational content for that teacher. So if they like that particular lesson, it was successful with their students, Amazon will now give recommendations from that same developer or lessons along those same lines. Another group involved in education is IBM and Watson. If you remember Watson, that was the um, supercomputer artificial intelligence that beat the humans in jeopardy. Well, Amazon is now in the healthcare space, where a patient's records are uploaded into the Amazon servers, um, and then the current symptoms. And so what it does, it drives out a diagnosis and a treatment plan for physicians, for the healthcare providers. Well, they're now, IBM with Watson, as well as other supercomputers and artificial intelligence, are starting to do the same thing in education. So a child's entire educational history can be uploaded into the system. And the algorithms then drive out, here's the gaps in this student knowledge, here's what we think the next activity should be, and here's other students they should be grouped with, so they're all together at the same place at the same time. And the education is appropriate for them. So we can actually start to get prescriptive education. Here's the biggest change we need to make in public education. How we engage our parents. Parents know their children. And it doesn't matter that parent's economic level or educational level. They know their children. I often hear educational leaders say, we want engaged parents. For many of them, it's a bold face lie. They want compliant parents. They want that parent that does the PTO fundraiser. They want you to show up at back to school night, but they want you to engage their school on the school's terms not you and the parents' terms. Engage parents, ask tough questions. Why is this being taught in my child's eighth grade classroom? Why are we being grouped like this? Why is this test like this? Is there a better way to do this? And that makes many school leaders incredibly uncomfortable. We've got to engage parents. Here's another one I hear a lot of. My parents are apathetic. They just don't care about their child's education. That's not apathy, it's alienation. 
Public schools have pushed parents out of the school and away from the school and alienated them. Parents want to be involved, but it's like walking onto a foreign planet when they walk into a public school building in many cases. We need to embrace parents and engage them. They know their children. That needs to be a partnership between the home and the child, no matter how dysfunction, dysfunctional that home is or how challenged that home is. It's got to be a partnership with that family. Let's talk about these two kids. This is Lorenzo and Amanda. Lorenzo's gift was music. Remember, he was getting ready to drop out of school. But music allowed him to build relationships within the school. So much so that he became a leader in the school. In fact, a local professional sports team ran a multimedia campaign where he got to excel with his skill in music. And he led a team of students that beat out 30 other entrants to run that media, media campaign for that professional athletic team. After high school, he went on to study music and media production. Amanda, on the other hand, high flyer, school went too slow for her. So what'd she do in high school? She started her own consulting business. The teachers let her work ahead or let her work with her business and then catch up. Oh, her consulting business? By the end of her junior year, she had applied for and was awarded scholarship money in excess of what her four-year college needs were going to be. So she started the business at the end of her junior year, consulting other students and writing scholarship applications so they could have the same success as her in paying for their college. These are just two examples of kids that needed a project based a more individualized program that met their pacing and met them where they were with their skills. Thousands of other kids need that individualized attention and a program that meets them where they are. Notice I gave no specific instructions on how to turn this around. That's because it's up to every individual community and the school system within that community to determine the urgency where they are. And quite frankly, many communities and middle school, many schools feel no urgency at all. They feel absolutely fine with the product they're turning out, regardless of how great or dismal it might be. But I contend those communities and school systems that embrace the change are going to put their children at the front of the line in this and the worldwide economy for a career-sustaining job. Maybe a little history lesson would help us. June 1st, 1813, Captain James Lawrence was involved in a bloody sea battle off the coast of Boston. And in that battle, he was wounded and taken below deck. And as his crew took him below deck, he uttered that famous quote, don't give up the ship. Now, truth be told, he was only involved in that battle because he disobeyed orders. And as soon as he uttered that command, the boat was overrun, captured by the British. All the men were made prisoner. And three days later, he died of his wounds. Now, to honor Captain Lawrence, the Navy named the ship after him, the USS Lawrence. September that same year, September 20th, 1813, Commodore Oliver Hazard Perry sailed the USS Lawrence in the Battle of Lake Erie. But during the battle, the USS Lawrence was so damaged, none of its guns worked. It was taking on water. So Commodore Perry abandoned the ship. He rode a boat, he rode a rowboat to the Niagara. He then sailed the Niagara directly into the British lines, forcing their surrender and winning the battle. Perhaps we can learn from Commodore Perry. Is it time to give up a 100-year-old sinking model of public education and do something new to save our economy and, more importantly, save our kids? Thank you. Thank you.